welcome friends to this uh, short one day stop over that I am having on my visit from India on my way back to Chicago. This was a short stop over. I am coming after uh, visiting a city that has very heavy pollution in its, in its atmosphere. They say the unhealthy atmosphere is the polluted atmosphere of New Delhi is seven times the safety level. So I might have some hoarseness in my voice which I brought from there. So if you can't hear me very clearly, it's because of the climate and weather in Delhi. I've just come here for a short stopover, but I'm very happy to see all of you. The purpose of my stopover and to be with you at this time is to share with you the experiences I have had with my perfect living master, Hazur Maharaj Baba Savan Singh. You see his photograph here. He completely changed my life and he delivered what he promised. Many people have asked me, what is the proof that he was a perfect master? Especially some people came from Agra to New Delhi where I used to be working for the government and told me that I was following a fake saint because even his master, his guru, his Sadhguru, Baba Jamal Singh has not been appointed as a successor to Swamiji who started the Radha Swami faith. In the last words of Swamiji, they recorded them as Akhri Bachan he names four people, starting with Raya Saligram and then adding three more on the suggestion of people sitting around him. Many believe the only person he really nominated was one person, Raya Saligram. But nowhere, even amongst those four, is the name of Baba Jamal Singh mentioned. It was only after his death that his wife, Radha, she asked Jamal Singh, go to Punjab and do some work. They said, do you think is that good enough to appoint a master? Therefore, if Baba Jamal Singh himself was not a master, how can his successor Savan Singh be a master? You are following a fake master. There was quite a delegation who came from Agra to see me. And also they mentioned that even when the council that administered the affairs of the Radha Swami Satsang in Swami Bhag, Agra. They said, all right, he's doing some work, not a work of a Sadhguru. Jamal Singh has been asked to do some work. Even then, he began to do work inconsistent with the policies of the council in Agra. And they, therefore, excommunicated him. So these are all facts on record. They brought the record to show me. They said, why are you following a false master? You should come to Agra. Not only we'll honor you, we have a faith and belief. You may be carrying the dhar, which is pending. There's no Guru Satguru at Agra. Maybe you are the one. I said, I am not familiar with the dhar you are talking of, that special stream of spiritual power that comes to make a Satguru. All I know is, that I met a man with his white beard. He promised certain things and he delivered them. Whatever he said can happen. How you can discover your true self inside? What is the best method of finding it? He told me, I tried, it worked. So I accept him as my master. I am not looking for any wills or something, any statements and documents. I don't know Swamiji of Agra, I don't know Jamal Singh, I only know Baba Savan Singh, my master. He pulled me with his love in a way nobody else has pulled me. He convinced me in a way nobody else has convinced me. A very skeptic person like me was convinced, not easily. I had great doubts about him. I had doubts because my own grandfather, who got me initiated at a very early age, 
he took me back home my father did not know i had been initiated by him and some people some satsangis followers of great master came to our house and my father very joyfully said look my son ishwar has been given full initiation by great master at this young age only 9 and 1/2 not half initiation he used to give half initiation to some people, some children over young so the other satsangi said we are very sorry to hear that because when you get a young child initiated at an early age he doesn't understand what initiation is he does not understand what spirituality is you wait and see when he grows up he will find out this was all forced on him by his parents and he'll run away from it and he would never accept the spirituality just because you never gave him time to understand it when this conversation was going on between those of sangis and my father i was overhearing it from the next room and it occurred to me those people are right i do not know who this master is i don't know if he is the true one or not i don't know the path is correct or not i have never had a chance to see it they are telling the right truth not only that when i was initiated before initiating the great master made a very powerful statement he said what i am going to give you and share with you with this naam daan with this initiation i got from my master baba jamal singh it worked for me i hope this will work for you if it does not you are free to go and find another path you are free to go and find another guru he did not stop us from the search which i liked very much that he is not creating a cult or binding us down somewhere he is saying go and search therefore after hearing those other satsangis and remembering what great master said i went on a search and did not believe what he said could be the only thing i got converted to islam with a muslim friend of mine i was in college i got converted baptized into christianity i followed other religious traditions i went to the yogis up in the mountains meditated with them all kinds of different meditations all kinds of yoga practices because i wanted to find something better than what great master baba saul singh had given me and after all that i discovered i could not find anything better incidentally today it is more than 83 years since i was initiated in this very month in a few days i am going to be 93 years old so with this long experience having tried out his method if today somebody can show me a better method i will go and accept it and this should be in accordance with his directions if you can find something better take it so i told my friends from agra i said i am not going by who succeeded who who is on the gadi who got the papers who does not have papers i am going purely by my experience and i can tell you now that experience that really determines who is a perfect living master is the experience of being pulled internally in a way no amount of thinking can do even when the thinking is against the pull you are the pull still keeps on going on that pull of some strange kind of love not the kind of love we see around the world but a strange kind of pull which makes us like to go and see that person again and again i think that pull is very important to determine who is a man the re- reason i found much later why that is true the reason was that when we meditate we are trying to use our mind making our effort to concentrate our attention on something we believe is our true self all meditation all good meditation involves that you place your attention within yourself concentrate your attention and discover who resides inside this body if the body is not you it's very simple method all meditation is made with an effort i am going to meditate you require an eye 
therefore if meditation is made by the mind obviously it cannot be something that can take you beyond the mind we know from all scripture that we studied that we have a soul and atma that is immortal that creates life in us that soul or atma that creates life in us is not the mind the mind is a thinking machine added on to our soul which gives life it gives life to our mind give life to our senses give life to our physical body that is why we know that the mind is constantly trying to have an experience outside which it has created now i am going to say a few things which are verifiable verifiable by very simple test process the few things are this body of ours is not our self it is born and dies very short memory in cosmic time of billions of years even hundreds years of life even little more is not much of a life very short period but if we die what happens to us do we survive or this is the end of life this is a big question people are asking this question over and over again going to people who have had near death experience that when they died critically dead their heart stopped their breathing stopped then they were revived and therefore they were able to tell what happened in between that they were still alive they could see their body thousands of cases of near death experience are showing there is something that remains even when we say we have a clinical death but maybe that is not so at my age my friends have died not many have survived even up to my age i have gone and seen them in hospitals i have seen them in hospices nursing homes and i see how they die the death does not take take place as instantly as we believe death takes place in the body by stages when the person is dying first he does not know where his hands and feet have gone then does not know where his arms and legs have gone i've seen people in terminal states saying please place my leg on this side it's already on that side what is happening what what is being drawn out of the extremities of the body is life itself consciousness itself awareness itself is being pulled out they are still speaking to us as it goes further at the bottom of the torso there they become unaware of it as if they are flying then the life is being pulled up further awareness is going up when they reach the heart they can't speak you can see the eyes moving trying to say something where it goes up higher to the throat even eyes start becoming still where it goes to the head they die the body is finished there nothing left in the body i've seen that happen is it possible to simulate this to copy that can we merely copy that like one great saint raman maharishi he did you might have heard his story that he was very sick at one time he had one servant attending on him who went away some for some errand and raman thought he was going to die and he said nobody is here take care of me the question came why am i afraid of dying what happens when i die let me pretend i am dead and he pretended that he has stopped breathing he actually stopped breathing made his body stiff the rigor mortis set in and he said but i am thinking so clearly now how could i be dead this was the opening part of his search for the truth about himself about life and death if we also do the same thing a pretended death how can we do a pretended death the way is very simple that since the awareness is being pulled from the extremities on to the head to die something lies in the head which is pulling us up if we have say a soul a unit a point of life where does it operate from when i am asking this question where am i 
am I in my hands? Am I in my legs? Am I in my body? The answer comes very clearly that I am operating in this body somewhere from my head. It's interesting to watch that our most important sense perception, like seeing, is at the eyes in the head, ears to listen in the head, nose to smell right here, taste mouth here. In this small part of this body, we have all the sense perception. The tactical sense is the highest in the tongue. All that is happening, the strongest part of a body to experience this world happens to be in a small section of the body. If you want to cut it narrow, you are close your eyes, you can even feel that the nose is below you. Because our basic way, basic sense for which we determine our presence in the head is the eyes we wish to look out. We close our eyes and even in the darkness that is created by not looking out, by closing eyes, we feel behind. Another interesting fact is that we have two eyes. We could have had one eye. It would be a very different experience of life. The two eyes are seeing two different things. They cannot see the same picture. They are divided. And if you place a finger in front of you, you see two fingers if you are looking at a distance. If you concentrate on the finger, it becomes one. The rest of it becomes two. That is because the two eyes are not seeing the same thing. This very fact is taken into account when they make 3D movies. They put special glasses on you which see different screens. Two pictures are put on the screen and you see it as one and create the depth of space and space and time. This space is created only by virtue of the two eyes. If you had only one eye, everything would be flat would be very different experience. The two eyes make it so wonderful that we create a distance and space. But when the two eyes are seeing two different things, why are we seeing only one? In the case of the 3D movie, we are combining with glasses. How are we combining now? And where are we doing it? If you examine the two eyes seeing two different pictures, where they combine to make it one, it's not outside anywhere, it's inside. We are behind the eyes. And there have to be a point where the two eyes can merge a picture behind. If you merely examine this matter of where the two eyes see, you will find it sees sufficiently behind the eyes, actually, to be more precise, exactly between the ears. It's very interesting that we are looking at the world from the center of the head, not through the two eyes. The two eyes combine, therefore the center of the head where we are combining the two eyes is called the third eye. We often hear of third eye center. Third eye center is nothing but where we combine. And it's such a beautiful place, so well located that by knowing where it is, you also know it's exactly between the two ears. The next best sense perception of hearing. So when we hear, we could have had one ear also. If we had one ear, we could not have known any idea of direction. Now, because the two ears don't hear the same sound, one is more than the other, we can determine which is direction. So space and direction are being created by two sense perceptions right closest to where we believe we are operating from the third eye center. Third eye center controls our location for seeing, our location for listening. And if you examine the other sense perceptions, they also take place in the brain behind the eyes. If this is so, can we test it out? That this is really so. We can. Just be going there. How do we go anywhere? Not with the body. They are trying to go with something other than the body. We are trying to examine if the body is not our self. Where are we operating from? So the best way to go somewhere where our body is not going is with a gift given to us called imagination. 
supposing i want to say let us imagine we are sitting on top of this building we can imagine we are there if i say let's imagine we are standing in that corner all of you can for a moment imagine you are both there imagination is a way by which you can locate yourself somewhere so supposing you imagine you are sitting inside the head you can do that what is it that is taking us to a location by imagination it is our attention we have this another second gift powerful gift of attention we want to read a book we put our attention on the book i want to appreciate this flower my master picture i can put attention on it and the third gift we have even more wonderful than these two is the power to concentrate our attention supposing i concentrate my attention on this flower little while the flower will become clearer and clearer for me and i will not know who is sitting here otherwise i am aware so the awareness is being pulled up here and it leading to unawareness outside the greatest gift that we can use attention concentrate our attention and become unaware of that on which the attention is not there that's amazing supposing we were to put our attention on the so called third eye center the the point behind the eye between the ears and we we imagine we are there just simple imagination and concentrate our attention there how by performing acts there we think there we see our imaginative self there we make picture there we say we are imagining we are having a cup of tea there we have inviting friends there we are dancing there we are singing there everything we are doing outside with the five senses of the physical body we can imagine we are doing there the more we do that the less aware we will be of what is outside naturally that's what it is you would be surprised if you try this experiment sufficiently long just thinking of what is happening there you will not know where your hands and feet are going if you continue that exercise you won't know where your arms and legs are going continue further you will not know where the bottom of your torso is going continue to play this game inside you will not know where the body is going precisely the same steps of withdrawal of attention that takes place in physical death clinical death great way to experience death what will happen supposing you succeed in doing this which is not difficult people sitting in meditation workshop with me most of them achieve this very easily because unlike how they have been taught earlier that meditation is merely to close your eyes repeat words and so on which takes you nowhere this is an actual withdrawal of attention within yourself to the third eye center many of my friends who have been initiated by masters for 40 years 50 years are telling me they close their eyes and they meditate mechanically 50 years nothing has happened naturally their awareness of their physical body is constantly there how will they go anywhere they are thinking that just by closing eyes trying to listen from this ear or that ear maybe right ear they are constantly putting their attention on the physical body it remain their only reality they are not been drawing their attention from the body at all then many of my friends are telling me and that's why i'm sharing these things with you many friends who have been initiated for long period telling me we are still searching our third eye center it's very hard to find out third eye center and i said where are you talking to me from now you cannot be anywhere else except third eye center when you are awake that's how you are awake because you are operating from there you are searching something where you are so that is why big mistake to start searching something where you already are operating from all you have to do is to start putting more activities more concentrated attention on that point when you do that some strange things happen the most important thing is that you forget this reality and that imaginative self becomes your reality because you are not experiencing the physical body you are not experiencing the physical world 
the most surprising event happen if you do that and that is how your memory functions in that state when we are in the physical body when we try to remember something we always remember something associated with the physical body excuse <coughs> me what would be your memory like if you are trying to remember something inside will you remember physical things or remember what is happening to the imaginative self you just created and is sitting there you start remembering things which you experience 100 years ago 200 years ago 500 years ago it will not look like that you are reading something this your own memory coming back it's a memory of your own self that is the first experience that will tell you that what you thought was merely your imaginative body had a life of itself of its own which it lasted much longer than the life of the physical body then you discover that that inner self of yours is an older self than this one what is that self what does it consist of the self has the same feeling of i the feeling of self the ego i am there still the same and by the way that i never changes even when we are in having a dream at night then also we become unaware of our body we go to sleep we have a dream in the dream we are running about all over who is running not somebody else same i went to sleep on the bed our location has changed our activity has changed our body has changed our everything has changed still the i remains the same the self remains the same similarly when you imagine yourself there the self is still the same everything else changes except the self you will notice that if you are able to sustain that experience and do it every day just to have a actual experience of something that inside you more real than this physical body it only become real when you withdraw your attention from this body there you discover that the mind that thinks and holds memories is the same same mind you are having now the sense perception that you are using my eyes my ears i am hearing the sense perceptions are the same you are a living being inside you are living being outside the life is the same the soul is the same the mind is the same sense perceptions are the same only difference is there is no physical matter in that self because you started with imagining something without physical matter so the difference between that internal self and this outside self is merely matter has been added to yourself but by adding matter you started believing that the material body is the self therefore you are confining yourself to an understanding you are only this physical body and somehow the physical body is operating its sense perception through various organs and somehow our mind in the brain is thinking thoughts and maybe we are alive we don't know what life is but all these are alive where death takes place all these are intact but we are unaware of anything this first step will reveal to you this is not true at all that what your inner self is is far more real far more durable far longer in life maybe 1000 2000 3000 years old you can even go step back and see how long you have been there during that time you have had several physical bodies maybe in different forms during the meditation workshops i conduct in united states i tell them in that state when they are withdrawing the attention pick up a mirror imaginary pick up mirror and see yourself close your eyes pick up a mirror and see yourself they never see the face that is in the physical body all the different face how can that possible you are trying to see 
what you know is your face which you see the regular mirrors here how could it be that in the imaginative self your face changes not only that you see several faces the longer you look at the mirror faces change and you wonder how can i be having different faces not only that many men have seen and they see the woman's face women have picked up the mirror inside see man's face how does this happen what are we actually seeing we are seeing a previous form of previous incarnation physical bodies we are seeing our own faces they are not somebody else's it's a mirror a reflector another big experience there are several experiences you have there which give you an an idea you have been in that state much longer than you have been in this physical body but there is only step one just to convince you by practice this physical body is not your real self it's a very short duration body we are wearing a garment we are wearing for a short period the inner body is the real self that is not real either how do we proceed further same method the inner self that we imagine is exactly like this body we imagine every time we want to imagine we are here or there or inside we always imagine we are like the same body that we have here so therefore there is eyes and head of the inner body with which we are seeing how about the third eye center inside that body in the head of that body can we then withdraw tension there yes it can be done little more difficult because we have to first sustain our experience for a certain amount of time that we can regularly go step into that state of experience and discover our astral self and then come back to the physical go into the existential if we have maintained that over period of time then we can meditate with the inner self meditation is still the same put your attention within yourself where you believe you are operating from which again will be the third eye center of your inner self what happens if you do that and sustain yourself there you will find that you will withdraw yourself even from sense perceptions you will have no separation and now i'm going to see now i'm going to hear now i'm going to touch all these combined into one perception as you discover that what you thought was thinking was taking place with yourself you were just wearing something which you were thinking <coughs> this body we call the physical body a sthul sharir the inner body we call sukshma sharir sukshma because it doesn't have matter now what we are experiencing has been called karan sharir or causal body we call it causal body because it is not our soul it's not our life it's not everything that we have really ourselves therefore we still name it as a body though the name given to what we are today thinking is our mind the mind is the causal body the causal body is operating to cause all experiences to happen everything that happening is because of the causal self because of the mind the mind is holding a memory which lasts several million years with one mind you can have several astral astral or secondary sensory bodies with one mind you can have several thousand physical bodies if this were not so the law of karma which we are talking of which carries our actions from one life to another would not operate if the body were to carry karma body dies it can't carry anything if the astral self were to carry it will just carry few thousand years it cannot carry more since karma what we say is a cause and effect happening in our lives in our experiences is happening because of the long life of the causal body or the mind karma what we say leads to an action and reaction we divide action to good and bad good action leads to a reward bad action leads to punishment this process which we call law of karma and so strong this law of karma is operating here we can't get out of it 
is all operating in the mind. The mind creates karma. The mind pays off karma. The mind enjoys the reward. The mind suffers the punishment. If the mind were not there, we would have no experience of karma at all. But this idea that karma is created by action is a misleading thing. Action is merely a follow-up what the mind decides. Karma is created by intention to act, not by action. So when we intend to do something, we create karma. If we do the same thing, we carry it into action, it enhances the effect of the karma. This karma is going on in such a strange way that we are unable to get out of it. What is the reason that a simple mechanism of cause and effect is holding us down? It is because the mind was created, so were the senses, so was the body, to have an experience in a different setting than our setting of our soul, our true self, or our total consciousness. That is in a different setting. This is a different setting. What's the difference? This whole setting of physical, a sensory or astral or causal is in time and space. Behind, beyond that, there is no time and space. Time and space are being generated by the mind in order to have this vast experience. The vastness of experience in time and space is happening because of the mind. This is a different kind of experience. Instead of everything happening in zero time and zero space, where it can be stored, everything can be stored and then spent, spent out. Some people say we can't understand how all the events of life can be put in one place. I give them an example. Do you see, they make whole movies and make a DVD out of it. When we hold a DVD in our hand, in one second, the whole story is there. When we play it, only then it becomes time. The same thing is here. Our creation has not been made in time and space. The whole creation has occurred in no time and space. By using the mind, we spread it out into past, present, and future. And this is a very strange experience of past, present, and future. Because we really believe that time is passing. That when I came here, it was past. Now I'm talking to you in the present. What I will say next will be future. We are all assuming this. That time is real. It's passing through us. This morning I was reading that even in one minute if I talk to you, our whole solar system has moved 7,500 miles away. Since we have come here, we have moved several thousand miles. They found from, they sent up, out a machine called Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Voyager 2 has given as first in the machine to go beyond the pull of the sun and get into space to find out the velocity of the sun and the whole solar system. It's moving at 450,000 miles an hour. The whole system is moving. Imagine how fast we are moving. Besides the movement of the earth and movement of the planet itself, which itself is very small compared to the movement of everything. Every second, they are moving far away. Doesn't look like it, of course. But what is this whole idea of space and time, movement here, whole universe is creating in movement, is all happening because of the causal self inside. Or oh, the whole experience of time space. But I'll give you something interesting to consider. We don't live in the past. We live in the present. Nobody lives in the past, it's just a memory. And nobody lives in the future. It is still to come. We are only living in what we call now. And imagine, consider carefully, now has no time at all. Even one billionth of a second passes, it's past. Before that, what's the future? We are all living in a timeless now. It doesn't look like it. Look like we are all living in time. But the truth is, we are not living in time at all. We are living in our nascent state. The nascent state before the mind came in, 
in the state in which the, the soul is timeless. We are living in a timeless now and how are we generating an experience that there is time even in the now? Just by looking at immediate past and call it now. Just what happened a few seconds ago is now. What happened a few minutes earlier is now. We are calling the little past as now. It's not now, it's past. Is future real? If the past is not really generating something we are calling present, is future real? Are the events coming in, coming from the future into our life? Not really. If you were to eliminate three functions of thinking, one, hoping, we hope for things to happen. Two, afraid, fear. We are afraid it might happen. Three, anticipate, which is neither fear nor hope. Hope is positive, fear is negative, anticipation is neutral. Supposing we, our thinking does not do th these three things, can you imagine there will be no future at all? We are creating a future. Examine this, what I am stating. It is worth examining that we have no such thing as now in time and we have no such thing as a future unless we use something in time like hoping, fearing, anticipating which all take place in the past. They can't take place in now. Therefore, what we call now is past. What we call future is past. So past, present and future are all past. That's the truth. But looks like we are passing through genuine time and we are living in it and it looks like it is just flowing. The strange thing is that the only way to know the past, only way for a human being to know the past is through memory. No other way. Can you imagine that what we call life is nothing more then memory stored somewhere in us, which we are just reliving. Just remembering things is life. It looks very real. The sense perceptions added on to this make it very real. Physical body makes it even more real. If you see the origin of life, how we are here, we are living in the same state in which our soul lives in a timeless state. Today, in experiments, they have done that they can put artificial memories into the mind of certain people. The subjects they program by power of suggestion, hypnotic power. What is hypnosis? Hypnosis is just putting some suggestion into the mind of a person, and the person begins to believe it's his own thought. What they are doing, experimenting in some institutions in America, they are putting memories into live patient that they are somebody else and then they see how they act, they start believing this is their life. They can never understand as an artificial memory has been put into them. Previously, during the war, in the Second World War, the Germans first used and the British then others used methods of putting ideas into the height, into the mind of people, first tire people out especially soldiers that they captured. They wanted to change their thinking and they would then play uh, certain thoughts by tape recording and tire them out so they can't keep awake. When they were sleeping, they play this uh, Hitler is great, Hitler is great. When the soldiers would wake up, Hitler is great, really. They began to believe it, their own thinking. Memories can be installed into us like that here Imagine, before we are born, before our sensory systems are born, before our physical bodies are born, when we are dealing only with the mind, but what we call the causal plane, a, a large number of memories artificially created of events are placed in us in consciousness. We will live over here as if they are really happening. That will be our life. Our life which we are leading here is nothing but a set of memories, 
implanted as the causal claim. Now, that's a big statement I'm making. Is this verifiable? Can you check it out? Of course. That's the whole purpose of deeper meditation. Deep meditation, going meditating within your sensory self. Putting your attention. The method is very simple. Putting your attention within your inner self and awakening that self and becoming unconscious of sense perception shows you exactly how this life is created. At all levels. Causal level, after level and this level. They are nothing but we are just playing that. So we are playing something. The secret of creation is discovered there. You can discover the creation of all universes at every level known to us just by going within yourself to the causal plane. You also find some other interesting thing like what we think is the individual mind, this division into experiences is taking place merely by shifting our attention from one reality to an illusion of another reality. Same thing like happens when we go to sleep. We go to sleep, have a dream, different body, similar to this. Sometimes people feel it's not the same body. One very old lady, 90 year old lady met me, she said, when I dream, I am already a very young girl running around. I said, I am also very old, I can't walk much, people help me, I go in a wheelchair. In my dream, I'm running again. I even forget what my age is. So we can change our bodies in a different level of experience. That's exactly what we are doing here compared to a higher wakeful state. Do we really have to journey, have to have a spiritual journey to find all this that I am saying? There is no journey involved at all. When you are sleeping and having a dream, you are far away. You are lost somewhere. And you suddenly say, I think I am dreaming. It can happen. Many people have had, I have had many times, a feeling in the dream. I am dreaming. But where am I dreaming? Where is my body? I have to find where I am sleeping. I am still taking the dream body to be real. That I have to now go and find something. When I wake up, there was no body. I created merely by a dream. I never left that bed. Was waking up a journey to wakefulness? Or was it merely wakefulness at the same point where I slept? You will notice every level of awakening. When you withdraw your attention from one level to the other, you don't feel you have come after a long journey. You just woke up where you always were. All meditation taught by all Swamis, Yogis, Masters that I have come across can at the most, at the highest, lead you to the causal plane from where all this creation is taking place. That is why most of them call it their true home. Such can't be have reached. Those gurus who have only gone one step, they call the very first region an inner body. To say this is not our body, we found the real one, that's our true home. The religions, I studied religions. I got a fellowship to study economics, business and things like that at Harvard University in America. But my interest was to discover what, how religion operates. So I studied 11 religions of the world to compare and see what is common in all those religious beliefs. I found that there were a lot of variations. They were emphasizing rituals, ceremonies, what is to be done, not what is to be discovered, very little. And religions have degraded themselves to external ceremonial activities, rituals. I thought there must be something common. Maybe way of their meditation, maybe discovering the truth, maybe discovering God, Allah, Ishwar, Parmeshwar, whatever they are talking about. I discovered the only thing common I could find in those 11 very important religions of the world was we are the only true one, all others are fake only common thing. Each one claimed our God is the only real one, all others are fake. Not a great discovery. 
but when i found that they are who are they worshiping what is their concept their concept of the creator is the creator of this world their idea of a true home is a very heavenly wonderful place of bliss all joys and bliss is there they are describing heaven which is a way of experiencing at the astral plane all heavens all hell are all in the astral plane those who are running those regions they are calling them god allah ishwar parmeshwar riyas everything is they are calling first stage ultimately religion has confined itself even in description to the first level but the actual practitioners of spiritual truths don't accept that they want to go within themselves not by reading books not by reading scriptures not by descriptions outside which are all descriptions made to fit in with our physical experience of this world we have to compare everything with what we can see here to describe our region as religion spirituality can go into area which you cannot describe so that is why these people go to the causal plane find that even our mind the thinking machine that we are carrying in our head right now is only part of a universal big machine operating in the causal plane the creative power we are merely participating in it and we think we have our own mind big discovery takes place very difficult to explain it till you experience it these what i am sharing with you are all experienceable events anybody can do with deep meditation proper guidance but this is not what i found was a true home no one was i satisfied with this discovery so great master i went back again and again to him and he said meditation cannot take us beyond that no meditation is ever thing people are sometimes thinking there are some special mantras special words so powerful that you repeat those words that you go to heaven repeat those words you go to your true such kind to your true home little realizing words are merely language and sound spoken here at the most in the astral plane the sense perception exists how can word take you beyond that no matter what words they are no matter how powerful they are they are words they are spoken word they can't take you even to the mind that is why the words are only temporary as used here in the description of these words some scriptures have mentioned they call the spoken words that we are using i am speaking to you i am also using sound so sound is referred to as shab audible something is audible i can hear therefore it's been called shab word where are they use shab in some scriptures sri guru granth sahib says shabde dharti shabde kaal shabde shabd vyapar ko everything is shab shab the sound everything is sound it created the universe it created everything it created itself that description of a word of a sound what does our veda say rigved says rigved says nad created the whole universe nad again sound in the bible christian bible john's gospel the opening sentences of john's gospel are in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god how can you give so much importance to something which has been described as something that can be heard audible shab nad word all audible things there must be some reason why they we have so much importance given but the truth is that if you understand what shab is when we are speaking you might call it varnatmak shab one that can be spoken and written you can distinguish it from music where no words are used so when you say this is shab that is i am using it to explain things to you if i don't use them i can't communicate with you at all i can't even tell you my experiences i can't tell you the teachings of the great master 
varanatmak shap has to be the beginning of our understanding our own self but when we want to hear something we can hear music beautiful music best music to hear is music of your own self inside most people don't know there is a musical ringing from the same self which is making you say i want to meditate same self which walks about in a dream same self that we draw the attention and goes to a sensory astral self the self is generating a music which we can hear what kind of music is it it's very no melodious people have heard that music they describe its beauty how wonderful it is it's got a melody of its own it's not ordinary music where does it come from from ourselves so they say that if you want to move upwards go from varanatmak shabd to that which is merely a melody or a dhun and they change the terminology as a dhun atmak shabd the shabd become different become dhun atmak just a sound inside same words we are speaking outside to go within and hear the sound inside become dhun atmak what happens when we hear the sound or we draw attention with the help of the sound sound is coming from within ourselves we listen to the sound or concentrate our attention on our inner self in the inner eye what happens to the sound it becomes little different it becomes a continuous sound a continuous sound in the sense when we open up there it looks like a sound was there all the time that we have been listening to it forever these sound varnatmak only when i start speaking you can hear inner sound the dhunatmak you can only hear when you put, put attention on it when you go beyond that that sound is continuous and you have been always hearing it except you have stepped out of it you step in it was always there you were always hearing it in that self the name of the sound then changes it's no longer dhunatmak shabd they use another phrase for it called anhad shabd anhad is limitless that's a kind of experience and they not you just like that it is an actual experience when you go there but that is not our self then the self that is generating the mind generating these experiences which we call our atma our soul it lies beyond these is a creative power is a creative self that creates the mind creates all these creates all the experiences most powerful creative force in us is our soul we can't describe it people call it consciousness seat of consciousness creative consciousness totality of consciousness all words which we are trying to use because we are explaining it in the language used here it can't be explained otherwise but if it's a soul and the soul is a creative power outside of time and space then these sounds i'm talking of when varnatmak or dhunatmak or anar cannot take place if there is no time and space at all and we still say the self is generating the sound what kind of word can we use to describe it in the description in the layer they say then that becomes sar shabd sar means the real sound real sound is no sound at all what the sar shabd real sound sar shabd is our own soul so the whole sound that we are trying to listen to even in meditation here is being generated from the soul the soul is the sound of course we can go even higher than the discovery of the self but not through meditation the soul cannot be discovered through meditation nor can anything higher be discovered by meditation the way to have that not only experience experience is also mind to have that awareness to have that highest awareness something else must happen something else beyond our mind must pull us from within we know what can pull us without mind we have experience right here i mentioned in the beginning trying to describe who a perfect master is i said the pull of love 
of a master we feel here. That pull that comes. The sense of we love, not ordinarily known. Masters are human beings like ourselves. That means there's no difference. Don't think they're superhuman beings. They are ordinary human beings, born in the ordinary way like us. They died like ordinary way like us. None of the greatest masters ever survived. They all died, including my master Baba Savan Singh. Second April 1948, he died. I was a homeopath treating him, along with another homeopath from Switzerland, Dr. Pierre Schmidt. We saw him dying like anybody else. Or oh, this body dies exactly the same. When we say that person, that human being, is a perfect living master, Sun Sadguru, the body has the same stuff, the same problem, the same destiny. No change at all. The body is exactly like ours. Then what's the difference? The difference is their awareness. What are they aware of? We have to practice hard to go even to the first stage, to withdraw attention. And they are aware of the first stage when they are in the human body. We have a hard time to go to the second stage by deep meditation. They are aware of that when they are in the physical body. We can't go beyond that by, without the pull of love. They are there by the pull of love of their master. We can't go to our true home unless love is so strong it can pull us through the darkness of everything. They are already there. A perfect living master whom we call a son, Satguru, is aware of all these levels we are talking about at all times. Not somebody who did a great meditation one day, saw a lot of things, has come back to tell us stories about what he saw. That's not a perfect living master. A perfect living master, when he is talking to us, he is talking from all levels. That is why if you hear these masters talk, you will find there is never any maybes or perhaps in their talk. It's not speculation at all. It's not mental at all. They are telling what they are seeing. They are telling what they are knowing at all times. That is why the difference is only in their awareness, not in their bodies, not in their life. But because they are operating at that level and they have realized that the highest level which is our true home. We are being created from a single source of a single totality of creativity, single totality of consciousness, single totality of life. No separation at all. Therefore, they know we are all the same, just through experiences being separated here. Of course, the most valuable instrument for separation is our mind. The mind separates us more easily than any other part. What was the need of the separation? If our true home is described as ultimate bliss, the highest bliss, highest joy, highest awareness, all kind of descriptions have been given to our true state from where we all emerged. Why did we not stay there? Did we have to come here? What for? Did we have to come into misery and pain and suffering? That doesn't look a very wise step to take at all. Certainly not an intelligent step to step away from the great joy we are having and come into this world of duality, pairs of opposites. Good reason for that. Many of you may not have heard of it, that in our true home, where there is only unity, one, there is no duality. It's all one. It's non-dual state completely non-dual state. Consciousness, even in non-dual state, appreciates itself better with a pair of opposites, which we learnt by creating this world. Supposing here there was no darkness. We have darkness at night, night in the day, and therefore we appreciate both. We can see what is darkness, what is light. Supposing there was light all the time, Think of it. Supposing in this world, whether we close our eyes, open our eyes, there's a certain amount of light always. Do you know none of us would have ever seen it? We wouldn't even know that exists. It's a darkness that made us aware of light. The whole concept 
of experiencing has arisen from pairs of opposites, duality. So this is a whole dual world of duality created here. And as it happened, the world of duality, the entire creation of duality becomes an opposite of a true home of non-duality. We have significantly created an opposite of something where no opposite existed, thereby appreciation of a true, true home takes place because of this creation. Just by coming here, where we are now, just by having this experience, what we are having now, we become greater appreciators of our own true state when we return to our true home. Kabir Sahib, one of our good mystics, in a book called Anurag Sahib, Ocean of Love. It's a conversation between Kabir and his disciple, Dharamda. He's explaining in a story form how this world was created. And he says that the souls that are in our true home, unlimited souls, true home, only a few got a chance to come into creation. And we are those souls sitting here. We have come into creation. When we go back to our true home, we are so appreciative of that state of non-duality. We dance and joy. So he says, these souls that are still there, he calls them buns. And so that have come down here and gone back, he calls uns. He says, when the huns go back to a true home, such kind, the buns say, what is so special about you? You're dancing more than us, feeling more happy than we are. What's happened? He said, you don't know what you're missing. You have no idea what you have. The idea what you have in non-dual state is only possible if you had a dual state. The whole purpose of creation can be explained with some simple argument. That we have created an opposite of our true home. When we go back to our true home, we discover the beauty of having made this trip here. Had an experience of ups and downs, high and low, night and dark, night and day. All this experience is helping us to appreciate something that's already there. And this is not created by mortar and by physical elements, by electrons and molecules. This has been created by experience, sensory experiences. Can you imagine if we did not have sensory experiences today, there would be no world for us. Nobody has been able to find anything in this world except through sensory experience and memory and projection of memory. Even abstract thoughts are just created, just from memory, from remembering, putting things together, and saying a world exists, a past exists, galaxies exist, space exists. Every discovery is all sense perception. We use equipment, machinery, and say we have seen more. Seen where? Seen in our head, with our eyes, with our hands, with our sense perception. Sense perceptions are creating this universe. Are we using sense perceptions to an already created universe? Or are we creating the universe as we go along? The materialists have been arguing for thousands of years. You have to have an outside world. We are just here to experience it for a short time. The world has existed for millions of years, billions of years. We are here temporarily just to see it, and then we go. We don't know where, but we go. World still stays. We see people dying every day. They come, they die. Obviously, no. They are not saying that the world was created when they came. But did we come when the world was created? Did we create the world? Did we create time and space for come here? Well, it's possible we did it. How can we find a parallel, some analog to discover this? Let's imagine we go to sleep, which we know we sleep every night. We dream, most of us dream every night. When we don't dream, we feel we never dreamt, we're still dreaming. When I went to the United States in 1960, 62, <clears throat> this was a very big study there, sleep and dreams. They were even studying if dreams are really another, another space-time existing somewhere where we go. Still being studied even today. How can we get all that information of new places in a dream? But what happened? 
they would put subjects to sleep and they had cameras to see their rapid eye movement and they had all instruments to see their vital signs what heart jump heart jumps on a certain scene that they are watching they discovered very clearly that when a human being sleeps every human being every subject that came there they all dream several times a night in the morning they say did you dream no i never would dream this elimination of the memory of a dream is so fast even people who remember the last dream from which they wake up the dream fades with the 30 seconds with the 30 second we forget only some dreams which has lot of trauma a lot of strange strange experience mostly traumatic mostly frightful we remain remains with us for a while but soon we get to know we are here and dream fades away we tested that when a person is dreaming at night his eyes are moving what they call rapid eye movement rem rapid eye movement was considered a sign a person is dreaming so when they found a person sleeping a suddenly the eye movement has started they would wake him up and ask him what are you seeing and the person would describe the dream and they would record his voice then he would go and that would stop still no movement of the eye after about 15 20 minutes another dream starts so they would record every dream and they had thousands of subjects that tested before they came to their conclusion they discovered every human being dreams several times every night but 99% of the dreams are forgotten and they are a separate set of experiences we are having in that state so they found that in the dream we can have a sequence of events taking place for example one person said yes i saw i was a child i remembered my childhood i used to go to school and there i met a girl and i fell in love with her and we used to go out together we had meals together we had done this we decided to get married and we got married and then we had children i remember i got very old i had a white beard i got so old and then i woke up the description itself of his dream lasted about half an hour just to describe and the dream took place only 7 minutes on the clock what does this mean 7 minutes of the closing of the eyes created a description which is whole life he was describing 50 60 years of life it took a dis- description took half an hour the dream was only 7 minutes very strange thing not only the time was very different in a dream than the wakeful state he described that during his time he went into an old palace which was several thousand years old and he asked those people when the palace was built they said 10000 years ago the oldest in the world in the dream he created a past of 10000 years in 7 minutes if we can create time and space unlimited in a dream and supposing we find this physical experience is also a dream compared to the wakeful state are we not creating this thousand billions of years just in one second in fact somebody told me a joke he said in heaven where brahma ji lived the creator time is different one moment there is thousand years here so somebody said brahma ji this is told in england and i mean in usa the dollars are the currency he said brahma ji is it true that one dollar in your state is equal to million dollars here in the physical world Yeah, that is so time is also like that one moment there is a million years here he said can you give me one dollar there which i can see here brahma ji said wait a moment this is a million years here just to show that the creation of time and space is taking place merely by shifting our attention to a more sleepy state 
therefore the spiritual journey is not a journey at all it's a state of wakefulness to our levels and the lower level become like a dream it remains real so long as we are only in that state and judging reality by the means available in that state for example like we are say this is real and by the way you can't help it this is the only reality we are experiencing all of us no matter how many lectures i give no matter how many descriptions i give our reality is physical reality we are sitting at the physical level how do we prove to ourselves this is real i want to know if this table is real i want to know if these flowers are real what will i do i'll first see i can see them must be real i mean this is elucidation okay i'll touch them real i can smell them real how can it not be real when i have tested them out with my sense perception there no other way that we have ever used in the physical plane to judge reality we judge reality by using one sense perception against another now supposing in the dream i would say the same thing supposing the dream i would say i see the same flower somebody says are they real he is telling me no it's a dream i said no they are real i'll prove it to you i touch the flower yes i see the flower i smell the flower everything is the same they are real when will the flowers become unreal only when i wake up and discover the very method of determining what is real was part of the dream that's exactly what we are doing here we are determining our reality of a physical experience merely by checking one sense perception against another otherwise we have no idea the only way when we can be 100% certain this was not real is when we wake up to higher reality therefore people say this world is maya illusion mithya mithya word destruction it destroys itself again and again why called maya people want to understand they translate it illusion are we living in illusion not at all then what's the meaning of maya illusion what is the illusion the illusion is that what we are seeing the seeing is real what we are touching the touching is real the perception is real but from the real perception we are jumping to the conclusion the object is real that's the illusion illusion is in our head that we are assuming because the sensory experience is real therefore the objects are real you can't say the sensory experience is not real it is real you are seeing thing you are touching thing you are smelling those are all real the experience is real not the objects of experience that's what's called maya the illusion so we don't understand illusion does not mean it's not real we have generated real experiences at each level not to do not shadows not illusion in that sense we have generated levels of reality and when we withdraw our attention under the guidance of a perfect master we can find that the reality is exist in many levels and each level destroys the reality of the lower level makes it dream like so that's a great experience to have it's wonderful to know that perfect living master the ones i'm talking of like baba saul singh they exist wherever seekers of the ultimate truth exist there are very few seekers of ultimate truth most of us go to these gurus and go to these swamis and all to get help in worldly things i lost my money i my child is sick or so on so on left me so on so on done this to me all worldly stuff we go to them so many psychics exist with supernatural power there are people who have gone into the lower energy centers and done riddhis and siddhis and they can do all those things help us those are not perfect living masters perfect living masters come where one wants to go beyond the mind to true home that they appear in our life we can't find them because perfect living masters will never say they are master why would they say if their object is 
to come and pick up a marked soul, somebody that wants to go home, and they come just to take their soul home, why should they declare anything at all? They don't. Why should they perform miracles? Why should they perform strange things in the... Why would they prescribe a particular uniform to be wore? You should wear saffron colored. You should wear this kind of turban. You should wear this kind of thing. Why? If they want to spread something like religion, like making societies, then they will work here. But if they have come merely to pick up a soul to take back home, they have to be like ordinary people. Their method of taking us back home is not through meditation, which anybody can teach us. Their method is to pull us. First, the feeling they are pulling us here with their unconditional love. That's very important. Unconditional love. If you find that they judge us, are we are good or bad, and then they love us, not perfectly master. If they see our karma is bad, therefore they can't pull us, not perfect living master. Perfect living masters come to take the soul back, not the mind, not the body, not the senses. And they always know the soul that wants to go back is seeking inside to go back. Even if the mind is saying, no, mind wants to stay here, enjoy a little longer. The soul says, I am tired. Perfect living master come into our life when we are tired of the show, which we call life. If you are enjoying it, they don't come. Have a good time. Your time has not come. But when you feel you have had enough of it, this is not, you don't feel this is your place. You want to go to your true home, they appear. That's what they say when a chela is ready, guru appears. They never say when Chela is ready, you can find a guru. You can find many people who pretend to be gurus, who want to declare they are gurus, who wear special costumes, special clothing. You can find lots of them. Perfect living master don't come like that. They come as friends, like ourselves. They become like ourselves when they come here. And their method is love and friendship. The best friend you can ever find is a perfect living master in your life. A perfect living master will definitely 100% come into your life if you are a seeker of going beyond the mind to your true home. Circumstances, coincidences will be created for such a master to appear in your life. So that is why they come where seekers of that seeking exist, anywhere, on this planet or any other planet. So that is why it is a very big very big game. How do they know where the seeker is? Because they are at that level of where they know that the seeker and themselves are one. They know difference. And that time of that, that seeker was part of that to come back to the same awareness has come, they come and take us. They come here to take us. That is why they come in our form, our roop as a human being exactly like us. And because they become human beings, they act like human beings. They don't act like superhuman beings. They don't, if they were superhuman beings, we could not be their friends. I give, I give example, supposing a very highly enlightened person, superhuman, say there's a guru very human, he can levitate himself, he can fly in the sky, and while I'm talking to you, he enters from that door and flies over here. Supposing he is flying on top. You will all forget me and look at him. First thing I know. You will wonder, how is he flying? Many of us will say, there must be some strings attached somewhere. Our mind will start thinking like that. There is some trickery he can't fly without that. Some will start believing, maybe he has done some special yoga by which he can lift himself. Many of us will admire him. Some will adore him. Some may worship him, but none of us will be a friend of his. None of us will love him, but we'll admire, adore, worship him. Supposing while he's doing that, he falls down here. I know the front row will run to help him. I will also jump down to help him. Poor fellow has fallen down. First time some compassion and love will come in our hearts for that fellow. Love and friendship is not between such unequals. That's people who are at that level. You can admire them. You cannot be friends. 
perfectly the masters come as our friend as to show us the purity of their love their love is so unconditional non judgmental if we love them they love us if we hate them they love us if we kill them they love us that's the nature of their love spend time with them you discover the beauty the greatness of their love which is not bothered at all by what you are doing their their love is not come for your mind not for your karma not for your actions their love has come to pull your soul back to pull your life itself to where it belongs to take you out of the dream state and they do it by pulling you with love which looks to you like it's coming here from outside it's not coming from outside it looks like a human being outside is pulling you the pull is taking place inside many of these so called enlightened people want you to come come to our place we will tell you come to our ashrams come to our deras come to our headquarters we'll tell you perfect living master don't say that they say go within yourself we sometimes are fallen in love with them so much we say master but i love you here no no go inside but then i miss you if i go inside no you will find me inside you will find i am more inside than outside perfect living master say we are more inside than out then we go inside they are there the journey with a perfect living master inside is never alone there are many gurus who say we'll teach you how to meditate now go and do it that's the end of their responsibility perfect living master say go within yourself you'll find that who what you are seeing outside is actually inside and we'll meet you there the journey we want to go from one level to another will all take place as if the person we saw outside is also inside and goes with us once you establish that inner experience of a master he never goes away for this life and every life that you have is a wonderful experience nobody is ever lonely after you manifest the inner form of a master through the first stage of meditation that is why they say only come up to the first stage from there we'll go together to a true home so it's a wonderful thing i have shared all these things with you because it is part of my seva service to my master i am saying exactly what i experience with his teaching neither more nor less i am doing it to serve him because there is nothing like service like seva great master used to say seva is like meditation but seva with no expectation of any reward for it if you are expecting something or oh, you get something because you are doing seva that's not seva that's not service that's a business transaction i am doing this to get something seva is when you feel the seva you are doing is a fruit in itself and the opportunity to do seva has become the reward for the seva only when done like that that's what what's good, good seva they have described seva can be of three kind in this physical world first what they call money seva you are contributing to cost of these arrangements that being are being made cost of running an organization so on you are just contributing easiest seva least reward if the if you can call it a reward you just write a check and then the seva done the second seva higher than the seva of this cash and money order and check this seva with your body any seva you can take food for the master you can serve him you can carry his bag or master not available do the same things for his followers for co travelers with whom we talk all the time about the same master so serving anyone is also seva with the body but the highest seva continues to be seva with the mind the seva with mind is when you meditate not to get anything but to give it to the master an offering an offering of of your own meditation 
greater seva because the ego is moved out of it i meditate no i am offering you this meditation these are three types of seva all three can be done and all are good sevas so i cannot give the importance of seva i tell my own story everywhere i repeat it here when i was very young and there used to be no electric power in the dera there baba sabun singh was there so he used to give this course in the summer hot summer and a sevadar would stand behind him with a big fan and he would fan him one day it occurred to me what a great seva is doing so close to great master i wish i could do that fan so i crept near the stage and jumped on it to take the fan from the sevada and the sevada scolded me get down you are too small i want the fan no you are too small for that get down the great master was sitting on the chair he smiled he said give him the fan this incident i, I feel took place only this morning so clear in my mind he gave had to give the plan. i got up and i fan the great master can't forget it few minutes few minutes spending just fanning my master i cannot forget it today later on master asked me to help in building a road it was a dirt road kacha road from the railway station to there i had some political contact at that time so i was able to get that done he could save us he asked for small things i can which i can never forget today what i am doing is just another seva for him of course this seva has made me your seva as also which is incidental that i am also doing seva by sharing some tips with you about the methods which are used by the disciples of master to verify validate what they are saying is true and not only that to develop the love and devotion that ultimately will take us beyond the mind this is a path of love and devotion the rest is for the mind all meditation for the mind love and devotion for the soul very happy that you very patiently listened to me